thank you for coming tonight. Gary Stephan, a New York-based artist, received his MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute in 1967. He teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Stefan has shown in numerous exhibitions, including the Kleiner James Art Center, 2010, Woodstock, New York, Reading and Unreading, 2009, Kinsley Art Foundation, Berlin, Germany, and Ways to Make Things, 2006, Cynthia Brown Gallery, New York, New York. Recent group <laughs> exhibitions include Power to the People, 2010, Feature Inc., New York, New York, and his current two-person show with Richard Rizek at Devon Projects and Editions, Chicago, Illinois. Stephan's work is also included in many collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, New York, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, New York, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, among others. Please join me in welcoming Gary Stephan. Before I start, I wanted to um, thank Dan Devaney because indirectly, or maybe even directly, for all I know, I think that's why I'm in Chicago these last few days, uh, next few days. And um, it was Dan who obviously organized the show with Richard and my work together. The first part is up, at, as you may well know now, and the second part will go up in a week or less. I guess it opens, Dan, it opens Saturday, is, the, uh, is it open? So thanks again, Dan. It's, uh, it's great getting to work with you. And um, I'm going to show some things tonight that um, I put together in a way that I haven't tried to do this before. Nor I was, I was with um, this poet friend of mine the other night. And we were talking about how it was that people's talks didn't continue the aesthetic of their practice that they would have an interesting practice, but then when they made a talk, the talk became conventional. Almost like there was a, a talk that had nothing to do with art. Now. And I began to think about this because there's a, there's a term that I, I like, and it's called the surrender point. And it's that point when someone's aesthetic that controls a set of notions gives way and returns the object to the real world. Like literally, I saw something the other day where somebody had made objects and then um, <coughs> attached to the objects was a whole big bar of plug-in wires and then the wires went down and plugged into the wall to light these lights. And the question literally there became, at what point in that line does your aesthetic stop and the electric company start? And I, so I wanted to see if I could do a talk today that got at first little quirky things that have caught my eye over the years. And then after I show you about eight of these, I'll reference them to work. But it's not going to be a chronology of work. What, I, what, I, what I've done is I've isolated a couple of devices. And I'll explain why I think they're important. But a set of devices that have shown up maybe every decade or so much to my surprise. So the first thing is this. This, um, I guess it was in the early 70s, I went to a CC, and I wanted to see the, the, uh, the, um, the Giotto cycle. And in the Giotto cycle, there's a part where this traveler has had the ground <coughs> opened up by St. Francis miraculously. And I was looking at this, and the thing that struck me, which isn't the part that's supposed to strike you, is that the back foot of the traveler is backlit. And I began to look at it, and that's why I organized this slide to make it clearer. I began to realize that this foot, which I've flipped here to make it easier, fits into the landscape above. That fittedness. I don't, know, I don't know what it means, but when I see things like that in works of art, when I see things where the artist may be even beneath intention, 
starts to bring things together. I think I sense meaning. So this is another example of this. These are Albert Pinkham writers. And I was struck by the fact that the saint by the side of the road is almost exactly like this other painting of writers of the old tree. These things could practically be mapped into each other. Again, I doubt that writer was even aware of this. And in fact, when we were organizing this, this is the first time I've shown this, so I was putting this together with my assistant the other night, and she said to me, do you think he knew that? And at first I said, well, yeah, I think he did know it, and I think it might be interesting that he knew it. And then it occurred to me, it didn't matter if Ryder knew it. What mattered is that I saw it, and it means something to me. Because I'm very, very much a believer that the responsibility for the making of meaning lies with the contract between the viewer and the artist. And the more the contract can be constructed, in such a way that the viewer feels that they have agency in the co-construction of meaning with the artist, the better I like it. So to just unpack that a little bit. Um, in the class contract, what, and this is up here not for this particular reason, but it will serve nicely. This is a Titian, Sacred and Profane Love. In this Titian, nobody walks up to it, or few walk up to it and say, I wonder if you really can paint well. I wonder if I'm really in good hands here, if I'm in competent hands. Because the essence of the pre-modernist contract is the artist always reassures you that you're in good hands. And the essence of the modernist contract is that you don't know, as in classically people saying things like, how do I know this isn't a joke? And in the modernist contract, you don't know if it's a joke. It only becomes meaningful when you personally decide to engage in it and say it's meaningful. If you say it's nothing, it's nothing. And that's different than the argument culture that's being made in an object like that. But the reason I have it here is different. This goes back to the writer. I, I was looking at this um, because I was, I was listening to this program on television about Mame a week or so ago. It was about his luncheon on the grass. And they were referencing a Titian, which I'm going to show you another one in a minute. And I was looking at it, and I thought, wait, you know what's interesting? There's a stone box in the corner of the painting. And another Titian that I know, this one, has got a stone box in the middle of it. But what they share beyond that is that this angel is looking interestingly down into the box. And he's engaged in something that is the essential, one of the essential ideas in surrealism, which is that what you can't see is as important as what you can see. Almost no paintings before De Pirico have as their subject the parts that you can't see. Everything, and I really, I've thought this right, I think I'm right about this. There is literally not one painting in Western art in which concealment is content. Revelation is content all over the place. Things are always being opened up. Nothing is being closed. So this was interesting because it's almost a, it's almost a question of concealment. So I'll just give you a little closer to that. So there's the angel busying himself in the darkness there, in the dark water. So this is the this is the Venus. This is the this is the uh, painting that Manet used to make the Olympia, or some people think he did. But when I was looking at this, they talked about the Manet. The thing that really struck me was the girl on her knees in the back looking into the box. I thought. Oh wow, we've got another petition with somebody looking into a box. This is, if you think about it, it may seem like a trivial thing, but think, go through the history of art in your head someday and think, how many paintings are there where people are looking into boxes or having parts of their body disappear in boxes? It, I, I, this may be the whole, the whole list. 
So this is the other one. This is the one that Matt ate was for lunch on the grass. The guy's talking about this in the show. And I realized the woman on the left is pouring something into or looking into another box. Now, again, I don't think Titian noticed this, but it was intriguing to me that it struck me as probably a non-intentional precursor of the surrealist notion of things being missing, being content. And this is the fourth Titian example. This is Christ being buried. And, well, it speaks for itself. And there's a close up of that box. And what I haven't done yet is I'm curious to compare the boxes, see if they're actually the same one. Maybe it was the one in front of his house or something. And this is, this is one of my favorite observations. I think after this, we're going to go to slides of my work. But this really just killed me. I thought this was just wonderful. One of the things that, that greatly interests me in works of art is that they be to the greatest degree possible resistant to the need for language. And it's paradoxical. I mean, it turned out to be great. I, I loved the time I was with, I was Jasper John's studio assistant for the first couple of years I was in New York. But it was ironic in a way that he was a person because of his use of language. But I think, again, maybe Jasper used language to show its limitations. It's part of the way I want to look at that. But the thing that intrigues me about this, uh, this Bruegel was, it's called the bird trap. And if you look up on the right side there, you see the little bird trap. And does it see the rope coming out of it? It's going to a little hole in the wall that is not there. A lot of people think Bruegel was an atheist. And a lot of people have said, well, this is a metaphor for life being a cosmic bird trap, that God has trapped us all in this. And I'm, I'm looking at this painting, and I thought the visual truth of that, the way in which we know that in our eyes, we don't have to think about it, is that in the center of the picture, and it's worth noting, that almost the whole right side of the picture is nothing but birds. All the birds are here. Those are the only two birds on the other side. And this side of the picture is almost all the people. Only those two people are on the other side. But right in the middle of the painting, the people and the birds are the same size. I think, and that was again, I don't know, I'm inclined to think that Bergman knew this. But the thing that I wanted, the reason I wanted to show you guys this, is because I think this is an extremely, maybe my, not maybe, this is my favorite example of visual meaning. I don't think anyone needs to have this explained to them. They just have to look at the picture long enough and the way it's constructed will be revealed. So now we're going to get to some work of mine. What I'd like to talk about uh, is, it, is essentially this idea of covering this content. I made this painting, it's a group of paintings, I think the second one's like it too, let's just look. Yeah, we can stick with this one for that. But I made a group of paintings in the 70s that used literal objects like this is real wood on the outside. And then, and then the rest of this is painted. But these are real panels. They're actually stacked up next to each other. And what I wanted to do in a picture like this was take an object underneath. Think of the thing underneath as maybe like a tuning fork. And part of the tuning fork has had a white card cover, covered part. Then what I did is I went back into this part down here, and I pulled this yellow out, or maybe it was that one, it's been so long I don't remember. And I said, what if it isn't the space between the two and four bars, but what if it's an object? And what if this piece, this remnant of the two and four here, is an object? And what if they're stuck together and they form a new object? The reason that interests me, and it gets back to that modernist contract with the viewer, what you're doing at that point, or what I've done at that point, is I've said to the viewer, here's a set of choices. It's not like there's an answer to this. But these are a set of options, and they seem to almost put, one part seems to put the other part in question. 
And now that I've made this visual proposition to you, you can decide how you're going to organize the bits and pieces. I'll just back up to the other one again. And this one functions the same way, but I mean, this, you'll see it by the end of this. One of the other really big ideas, and it, it's just captivated me when I was in graduate school, and it's just stayed with me all my life, is that the two ways in which paintings work is they work as real things in the world with real qualities like that. They have edges, they have, real, they have corners. And then they also work as windows. They work as fictions. And how every artist negotiates the fiction of the window and the fact of the object is one of the things that makes meaning. So I was taken, and, and the two ends of that, let's just push it to the end of that. At one end, you get people who don't want to be involved with paradox at all, like Robert Ryan. He says, no fictive space at all. It's an absolutely real object with real properties, real paint, real canvas, real stuff. And the whole project is about the, the self-awareness of it. There's other groups like Support Safis is involved with, I think, similar questions. And on the other end of things, you have painters uh, like Church or Vermeer, where it is all window all the time. I mean, you're supposed to just dive in and have no resistance from the thing as an object. I've always been interested in moving the thing back and forth in the middle ground, where part of the cues of it, like the blue, suggest that this is atmosphere, but the way the, way the blue works at the bottom by covering the object, it's working like, a, like an object now. It's not working like the space. So I've, I've always taken these cues for representation and tried to bump them up against each other. And remember, um, I found a book. I found a book once. And it's the only, it's one of the few books I regret having lost. It was a little book for, I guess, Christian fundamentalists, or certain Christians. And it had little, little chapters about how to understand the Bible and how to make a good life. And one of the chapters was called Serving Two Masters. The reason I loved the book is every chapter had a title that I thought was a painting title. Like that, I thought, Serving Two Masters. You can't make this up. This is a great title. So the, and the way <coughs> Serving Two Masters works for me as a meaning is because the two masters are the painting is a real thing in the world and the painting is a window. So it, it, I actually didn't name a painting serving two masters. Now this is, this is the reoccurrence of these things folding in on themselves 10 years later. This is two different paintings. I stacked them up just so we can see more easily. But in the, in the 80s, I worked with these things that I called templates. And they were real objects. And they were literally cut out of plastic. And they were about so big. So if you figure that they're all about that big, that painting across the top is probably 2 by 8. And that makes the painting below it 8 by uh, 14, something like that. And, and what I wanted to do was, was take these elements, maybe in the way that the, uh, the Jados were in the beginning, things that could be manipulated around, repositioned, and depending on where they were, they would take on different meanings. Because I think that's the way things work in the real world. It's like if you're going to light uh, a stage play, and you want two characters on stage, one is doing rather well, and one is doing rather badly, you probably put the one that's doing rather well in a pool of light, and then you put the other one, I'll do it, you take the other one out. And it changes the meaning of the characters. That's exactly how I use these templates. The templates, the reason I put them up on a shelf is I thought, them, thought of them as things in potential, that you like take down like a gun, and you can do things with. So I, I made this painting where I stacked the templates up. And then this is a little homage to my childhood. See this little thing right here? 
that little brace there is lifted from Snow White, which is a movie I saw when I was, I don't know, five years old. And then the, what's in the window, the painting within the painting, so to speak, is these things are being used to generate a line and then generate a line again near it. And that seems to fictively create a twist. So these ribbons, so, so to speak, are constructed by taking the templates, the surrogates up here, and using them as, as a linear device. And then this one down here is sort of what I'm saying about the stage light. This is the same constellation as this, but this is the one that's not doing well. This is the lucky one. This is a, this is a great, Martin Johnson Heath made this painting on the left. It's called uh, Gremlins in the Studio. And I'm sure he made it as a joke. The thing I really liked about it is it gets at the modernism. Even though it's maybe seen as a joke, it still gets at modernism. Because what he's done is he makes a perfectly credible, fictive painting above, and then has the water run out of it at the bottom and has it up on soul horses. I think that's the gremlin in the middle. So I thought this was a perfect example of, of the kind of tension that exists between paintings as pictures and paintings as objects in the world. And out of it, at that time, I made that painting there from that drawing there. It's one of the few drawings I've got a, a record of. I don't really keep good drawing of this. Now, this is a painting that's in, in uh, the show that Richard and I are doing as we speak. And it's the return of the card. The card is now back as a device. And in fact, it's also the, the device from the Martin Johnson key of, as it were, looking under the painting. So the way I saw this painting is that all of these, let's present, let's just view the top for a minute this way. The top is a German iron cross, almost. It actually has a little too much rotation because the true God of the iron cross would display in both directions. So it's the Iron Cross, which is something almost heraldic. It's almost like flag line. So I wanted to be able to paint that and create that kind of space. But I also wanted to make a picture space. So what I did was I carried all of the elements here through to here. So this space that tips up in there is attached to that formal or more formal graphic space above. And again, it's the return of the window and the card from the, from the earlier work. It's another example. This was also from last year. And what I did with this yellow, I was, because I, I made another one of these Maltese crosses in here is I wanted to see how big a rectangle I could trap in there. I guess it could have gone further this way, but that's as tall as it could get. So I made this big block of yellow, which all of these things, my thinking was, they all stand alone as abstract paintings, almost on a white wall. You think of them as a collection of paintings on a wall. Or, which is also the case, you can think of them as pieces of a big picture, most of which has been hidden by the white car. That painting's not quite that big, but it's, it's a good size painting. And if, as I'm going along, if anyone, anything crosses the line, feel free to say. Now, this is a, this a little painting that's uh, in the Woodstock show. I'm going to show it to you in a minute in situ. There it is. That's it, the second painting. Let me go back to it. So what I wanted to do with a painting like this, because here's the thing. The reason I don't think of these as abstract paintings is that everything in them, to me, has to be something somewhere. It can't just be an element. So the way this painting works is, 
Think of this as a piece of brown wood with a dark edge beveled back that's covering a gray window through which you're seeing the sky. And outside the window is probably another one of these there on the outside folded in. Maybe not, because the other possibility is that these could end anywhere. They could just end like that. But there's the possibility, right? And it traps that symmetrical object in the middle. So the symmetrical object in the middle also starts to be another way you can choose to look at it. So the windows, the windows back. But I was reminded when I, after I did this, of these paintings that I made, oh God, I think I made these maybe in the early 80s, in which I literally made an entire painting and then covered over enough of it with a wooden box that only part of the painting could be seen. You could come around the side and look in. But essentially, it's that surrealist notion again of things being hidden as content. So I hadn't thought of this when I made that, that other painting, this one. But it's the same notion. It's back again. It's the idea of by building something, a template that cuts off part of the whole view of the window, it, it makes a new order. And this is, this is a, like that other one I said, it was like a group of paintings. This is one of two big paintings called Paintings of Paintings, in which each of the elements, I think, functions like a painting in its, in its own right, and then they're assembled in this larger constellation. I think the, the antecedent for that would be something like Matisse's paintings of, of his studio. We got paintings all within a painting, and so did it too. Some of the salon pictures are like that. And there it is for scale. This is part of that, that show that was mentioned, the, uh, the Woodstock show. This was up for um, August and, and September in um, upstate New York. And this is the way things work for me. Those paintings, the little ones there, were not made as part of this. This wasn't made as a, as a piece like, let's bring all this together. Those little ones were made over the course of a couple of years where every time there was, a, there was a lapse in the studio, in a sense, I would go back and work on the idea of the cruciform because it's almost impossible to do anything, I, I, people think, with the cruciform. So whenever I would have a break in the practice, in a way, I would go back and work on these cruciforms. So they've just been sitting around the studio and then when, it, when I made the big one, I thought, wow, that's got another one that's in it. It really references these. And this, this space upstate had this terrible problem of having a stage in it. And I thought, you know, if I thought of these paintings as almost like hanging on a string, like laundry, I could walk them up the stairs and make a virtue out of this staircase. So that's part of the installation. Now, this, this again is that, that fiction and fact question. This is also an earlier painting paint from the, um, the late 70s. And what it has in the middle of it is an actual stretcher with the tight joints and everything. I, I had it made by a really good stretcher maker. It was kind of a beauty. But it has no, it has no space in it. It's just squeezed up against itself. And what I did was I used that as an element in this in this fictive space here, but I also used the notch at the top the triangles to help me get started with form making like that. And I think without intentionally doing it, I think this painting probably goes back to my Catholic childhood. I mean, it's hard for me to look at this and not think crucifixion. 
it's been a long time, but I, I guess the iconography is kind of well installed. <laughs> And in fact, at the top of the crucifix is always that little sign, I N R I. That's the that's part of the sign. This is this is my studio uh, this summer, and I was working on this painting. This is the painting I was working on while that Woodstock show was up, and it went along like this for about three or four weeks, where basically what I was doing is I was building that, that object in the, in the top is kind of simple to understand. It has one unit in the corner, and then it has twice as much here, and then twice as much there, and then twice as much of that here. So it just sort of progresses out. The cubes just get bigger and bigger. But what I wanted to do was imply that there was maybe a, a bar that was floating behind there. So you get you get those two layers. And then I was thinking that I was going to mirror it down into the bottom, that this would be almost the way things are in water. So we got a lot more developed. This is the only picture I have of it in process, actually. Um, but what was nice, if the, if the Iron Cross is an image that I wanted to take on because it's, it's both static and beginning to be dynamic, the other one that's completely um, unapproachable is that one. It's, that's the finished painting. The, obviously, the little one is something else. I put this in first to give you that chair so you get a little scale here. But what happened was between this and the final one is the painting just was absolutely going nowhere. And I, I was hoping I could get my wife's drawing she made for me, but I, I couldn't find it. But she made a drawing, she said, why don't you think of what's going on at the bottom as maybe like an object, maybe something like a shovel or something. You could move it around visually. I thought, I like that. That's, all right. That's good. I will. So this whole bottom that was very disciplined in this way ultimately wound up like that. Just sort of a broken version of what's above. And what's above, let me come back one more time. When I worked on that part above, for the longest time, it, it stayed a perfect little painting. It was solid, had solid little sides on it. And it wasn't until after about a month of working on it that these, these parts of the, of the wall of the painting broke out. And I had something real close to the swastika. And the reason this fascinates me is the, um, I, I went on Wikipedia recently just to check it out, and virtually every culture has had a swastika in it. The American Indians, the Hindus, the Koreans, the Japanese, obviously the Germans. And that's the problem. The Germans ruined this fabulous image. They took something that was maybe the best example of an image that's static and dynamic, at the same time, and basically put it off, off limits for a century. So I've been dying to get back to it. And without intending to, this painting got me back to a way to reimagine the swastika. And what was also nice about it is I remember when I, as a boy, because I grew up um, in, in the years of World War II, they would always show when they'd show maps of Europe, they would never show the, the swastika in its kind of whole form. They would always show it cracked and broken on the ground as though we were going to win, which turned out to be true. So I love the fact that as I began to move around in this painting at the bottom, it began to be one of those broken, broken forms. So what you have above is the ideal world, and what you have below is the world we actually live in. And the other thing that kind of fascinated me was this came along at the end of the painting. That's an actual black block of wood that carries the picture line out into the real world, much the way those blocks do actually this one. And that gets us back 
to the other one, the cruciform picture with the real support in it, I thought, oh, we're back to the, the paintings and the ones that have the framing parts. We're back to paintings that have fictional and factual parts. Yeah, there it is. Finished. And it is a slightly good feel like that. This is another view of the, uh, the Woodstock show. And what I wanted to do here was I wanted to take the two extremes of my practice, these ones that are almost like windows and buildings, and these that are very close to seascapes or clouds, and put them next to a painting that brings both of those devices together. So these become sort of the, the code, the way to break the code of the big pictures. And that, that painting before, let me just back up one more, and we're almost done. I'm going to show you guys a video, too. Um, the name of this painting on the right is Kearsage. Because one of the things that interests me in the Manet painting of the same name, that one, is in this upper part, Manet is doing two things that struck, struck me as pretty interesting. He's both depicting the smoke over the, over the, over the ship, and he's also enacting the paint, the, uh, the smoke over the ship. And by that I mean, if, if you wanted to paint my two arms like this, you would paint all of this one, and you'd paint the top of this and the bottom of this, but you wouldn't paint that. Because in the picture, it doesn't exist. But in reality, they do. So if you were going to depict this, you would just do the top and bottom. But if you're going to enact this in a painting, you would paint all of this one, and then paint all of the other one on top of it. Manet does that, it paints both ways. And it is what's being done here. This was literally the whole black object was painted. This was then poured on top of it. So this is the enactment of covering. And then this, is the depiction of it, because that really doesn't go on to this. This is just the depiction. So they, they're, they're formal notions, but somewhere along the arc of formalism, meaning sets in, and I think, I think the way it does in the, uh, what I showed the job in the very beginning. Even if it's not intended, that's how meaning emerges out of, out of the work without one having to sit down and think going in. You know what I really want to do is, I think if you just bring things together that you find interesting, you get emergent meaning, meaning will just show up. And I think I have now, oh, there's a close one. Let's just look at that. But what I'd like to do now is show you a short video about. Well, you'll see. I need to see how that Let me do this then. I'm going to. I don't want to see a lot of my videos. There's a bunch of them up on YouTube. This is one that just occurred to me literally when I was coming out here. Uh, certainly, fit this tall. And the whole point of a tracking shot is you're supposed to really learn a lot. But I also like this because it occurs to me, that's why I'm so glad we could do it today. I thought, wait a minute, that's the concealment of it. That's the concealment of subject. So I was, it was great that we could bring it up so easily. That's, um, that's all of my prepared part. If you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah. You mentioned your 
A lot of what? A lot of Is there something that that's supposed to be doing 
question, the idea of the, the surrealist notion that the 2D work isn't doing, or do they say the same things? Or I mean, it just seems like you kind of showed that as like a last minute quick thing to do. Right. This idea of concealment, I'm just wondering if it was just for you, was that a one off thing? It was 35 seconds, a 35 second idea? Just for, well, or, and how is that functioning along with the 2D? The 2D well, the work? Nice I'm also thing interested in how you just showed that, like just quickly at the end there. So just right. The, the interesting thing for me about the videos. It's like there, somebody has made, made the argument, I think it was in the, the 80s when, when a lot of um, women artists began to make photographs. I think it was the 80s. Um, and one of them was asked, maybe it was Cindy Sherman was asked, what's with the photography? And they said it's, it's an open zone because it doesn't have the male hegemony all over it. It's relatively free terrain. Video functions like that for me. I mean, the baggage for me of painting, of all the painting I've looked at, of all the painting I've thought about, of the ways in which painting carries meaning, for me is a huge deal. I mean, it's, I take painting to be a huge deal. Um, the beauty of the videos, and there are a bunch of them, if you want to check them out, there's 10 of them on YouTube. But the nice thing about them is their light is a feather. They have no baggage. So if an idea crosses my mind in video, I just make it. I don't think, well, how many, how many fitting into the history of video? I wonder how this plays in the politics. I don't know anything. I don't know any of that. So for me, it's a fantastic pleasurable relief. I don't know if that does that help. Is painting a fantastic pleasurable relief? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's fantastic, it's pleasurable, but it's no way. Right, right. No, it's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. Um, Can we close these lights down just a little bit? This might be a difficult question, but like, how do your painting decisions change? Oh, that's much better, thank you. Um, how do your, basically, how do your painting decisions change, um, like, after you make discoveries of uh, either uh, what they are to you or how they read you. How do they, how do, let me see if I got this right. It, how does it change from what it's like to make it to what it's like after I made it? No, more like as you're making a painting. Yeah. And you have an idea, you know, you have an approach or you have an idea. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, things are changing as you're making a right. discovery that you're like, yeah. how does that change um, the, the way you paint? You're, you're finishing the painting. Well, I don't know if this is going to answer your question. Let me, let's learn, try this. Um, when paintings used to get away from me, when they would start to go about their business and they weren't where I thought they were going, I used to get incredibly upset. I used to think, God, this is terrible. I can't, I can't make the painting. Now, I've made them long enough that it doesn't matter. Whatever, even great, you know, I, I can remember times in my life when I have great passages in the painting, and I paint them out, and I think, oh, no, that's the best part. Now I can have it again. I don't care anymore. I just couldn't care less. It's like there are a lot of the best parts coming, I'm sure. <laughs> because I've done enough of these things that even when the whole thing is crashing and burning and the studio is going to burn badly, I go, oh, we're in the crash and burn phase. <laughs> Just part of the drill. Part of the drill. Doesn't tell me anything. Doesn't mean it's all over. Although, actually, about three weeks ago, I went back to the house and I said to my wife, I think I'm done. I don't think I can make it anymore. She said, good kid. You'll, make it. You'll be fine. <laughs> so even now, I get that feeling. Yeah. I love this notion of a, a contractual agreement that you enter into mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with your work. Um, and I'm wondering if you conceive of and put yourself in relation to a postmodernist contract. I don't know what the postmodernist contract is. I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I, I don't quite know what you mean. Oh, well, I mean, you define a pre-modern contract as opposed to a modern contract. I'm using the word very loosely. What I mean to say is... And I, I don't mean to pigeonhole you. Yes. Very curious if you if you 
stop there and our, um, not that it would be wrong to do so, but if you're satisfied in, in being able to fulfill well, all me, of your, your work's ambitions. Yeah, let me point. open it up a little more and see, and I'll just tell you what it fully amounts to. The, the pre-modern contract says, I, the artist, have something you can be completely confident in. I am the surrogate for the state. When I paint Napoleon on the throne, I paint in his stead. When you see these paintings and you walk up to them, they're as bulletproof and perfect as the state of France. <coughs> that's, the, that's the contract. World War I puts so many people to the ground. And then, but before, let me back up before World War I. Let's go back to the 1860s. With the rise of the bourgeoisie, the classic order of, of European culture, of the aristocracy and the peasantry, is broken in half. A new group comes into the middle, the bourgeoisie. And Lenin said of the bourgeoisie that they destroyed the revolution because they mollified the friction between the top and the bottom. I think a more interesting way to look at that is the bourgeoisie was the revolution. The, the invention of a middle class was the revolution. Manet painting the luncheon on the grass is revolutionary because the bourgeoisie invented the picnic. The picnic is a perfect stand-in for the bourgeoisie because it says, you know we're going to have lunch? Wherever I say we're going to have lunch. There's no official places. There's no official houses. We're going to go outside and we're going to claim this territory or we're all going to have a provisional reality. Because the bourgeoisie are coming into the world in a provisional state. They have no status historically. So you first get the, the, the disruption of the bourgeoisie. Then you get World War I. I've got to quote you one stat, which is just mind-blowing. We have lost, in Iraq, Americans have lost about 4,400 troops in seven and a half years. I think that's about right. Does anyone know it more accurately than that? I think that's pretty close. Seven and a half years, over 4,000 troops. 1918, Battle of the Somme, World War I, one afternoon, one afternoon, not seven and a half years, one afternoon, 50,000 are killed. Soldiers. 50,000 soldiers are shot down, most of them machine guns. This is not lost on the art world. The art world first bumps into the bourgeoisie, then they bump into the insanity of World War I, and then to cap it off by mid century, you've got the atomic bomb and the Holocaust. So what the modernist contract does in various forms in theater and painting and everything, it says, oh, Jesus, how are we going to get the viewer to co-create meaning and be responsible for accepting, and the Andy Kaufman says, accepting this as funny or accepting this as meaningful, but, but finding that they have agency, that they're not passively sitting back. And that's what I mean by the modernist contract. I don't know what that really means. I've never read anything. I just over the years kind of pieced this together. It's my, it's my, it's my country. <laughs> That's what it really is. It's not my country. It's my country. Benito? Oh yeah. One more. Go ahead. Well, let's do one more. Dessert that was hot and cold at the same time. 
they came up with all this stuff, and none of it seemed to please him. At the end, they give the prince a hot fudge sundae. He was thrilled. And I thought, I'm not thrilled. That's not hot and cold at the same time. It's hot and cold, first hot and cold, then hot and cold. So I didn't really like the answer, but I liked the question. So I, I've always found, I've always found that what's interesting about the question of how you serve the two masters of, as you put it nicely, the window and the wall, is you can't serve them nicely. It's, it's a mess. <laughs> it's, it's a fool's errand. And the very humility of it, the very fact that, it can't, that there is no type of solution, is what makes it kind of humbling and interesting. You know? So, there we go. Now we get pizza?